The USA Radio Network presents the greatest radio programs of all time. Suspense. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet. This is Classic Radio Theater. Gangbusters! I was a communist for the FBI. Lights out, everybody. Now here's your host, Wyatt Cox. Crime drama this hour, Dick Colmer, starring as Boston Blackie. An episode from July 23rd, 1946. An episode about the murdering cuckoo clock. Let me see now. And, why, no, young lady, there doesn't seem to be much wrong with this watch of yours. (laughs) It's hard to hear it, though, with all these other clocks ticking. Well, I'm awfully glad that mine's not too bad. How soon may I have it back? Why, I don't see why you can't have it tomorrow. So soon? Oh, wonderful. Well, there's very little wrong with it. Now, I've got a pencil. Now, if you'll give me your name. Oh, yes, of course. It's Wesley. Mary Wesley. Ma- Mary Wesley? Are you the Mary Wesley who's always seen with Mr. Boston Blackie? Oh, yes. Blackie and I generally do run around together. That is, when he isn't running after a murderer. All right, I'll be in tomorrow. Thank you very much. Goodbye, Miss Wesley. Bye. Hiya, Dad. Oh, Walter, my boy, I didn't know you were in the shop. Yes, I was back repairing that clock of Mrs. Williamson's. Old-fashioned thing, isn't it? Yes, but a beautiful piece of work, my boy. We don't very often see clocks like that these days. No, I guess not. Say, Dad, there's another type of clock you don't see much of anymore. What kind is that, Walter? The kind with a poison needle in the winding key. Did you ever see one of them? Yes, I did. In fact, I saw one in a clock shop about... Two thirty years ago. Certainly looked innocent. I guess it was supposed to. Dad, could we make a clock like that? Could we make one? Well, Walter, that's a strange thing to ask. It's not so strange, Dad. I just wondered if we could make a clock that would kill somebody. <laughs> And now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. (laughs) Great party, eh, Walter? It certainly is, Mr. Van Horn. Glad you could get away from your father's clock shop long enough to join us. So am I. Dad's been keeping me so busy lately, I haven't... There you are, darling. I've been looking everywhere for you. Oh, hello, sweet... You know my wife, don't you, Walter? Sure, we've met. How's the clock business, Mr. Stone? Oh, it's great. After five years in it, I finally found out what makes it tick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of clocks, where did this handsome grandfather's clock come from? Huh? It's never been here before. It came this afternoon. I thought you were buying me a present. Not that I remember. I've never seen it before. <laughs> Well, maybe your wife bought it for you, Mr. Van Horn, and it costs so much that she uh, uh, forgot to tell you about it. Now, Mr. Stone, just what do you mean? Nothing. I was just trying to be funny. Well, you know that old saying, many a truth If you want to speak truths, my darling husband, I have a hunch it's a gift for you from one of your feminine friends. Dear, this is a party. Excuse me. No, no, don't go, Walter. I'm sorry. Now, no more quarreling, Richard. Suits me. Say, to get back this clock. I don't know where it came from, but it's running... Is it on time? Well, let's see. I have um, 10.29. What time do you? Hmm, the same. And the clock says just a little after 10.29. Must be one of your clocks, Walter. Those instruments of yours never do keep time. <laughs> well, let's not talk shop, Mr. Van Horn. Especially not clock shop. I have enough of that during the day. Of course, of course you do. Let's go over and join the others for a few minutes, shall we? That's a good idea. It seems to be... Oh, God! Walter! What was that? Walter! Quick, somebody, quick. Walter's been shot. This is unbelievable. Walter's been killed by that clock. Look, Rollins, I don't want to hear from you again till you've made that old clocksmith talk. Now get out of my office. Yes, sir, Inspector Faraday. And stay out till you get a confession from old Rand Stone. Yes, sir. I sure will. Uh, 
If I want anything done around here, I have to do it my... I said stay out of here, Rollins. So stay out. Sorry, Inspector. The name isn't Ron. Uh, Blackie, you stay out of here, too. What? And miss watching you make a sap out of yourself? I should say not. Uh, Blackie, beat it. I've got enough on my mind. Sure you have. The trouble with you is you haven't got enough in your mind. Oh, no? Well, what do you want? How long will it take me so I can say no? And how soon can you get out of here? I can leave now, pal, and let you alone on the Walt Stone murder. It shouldn't take you more than two or three years to solve it. Uh, well, let me tell you something. I've already found Walter Stone's killer. What do you think of that? Nothing. Of course, I don't believe it. But uh, what led to your brilliant deduction? Well, first of all, I know how young Walter Stone was killed. By a bullet. Most people who are shot usually are, are they? Yes, but they're not killed by a bullet fired out of a grandfather's clock. Oh, that's where the bullet came from. Yeah. When the cuckoo came out at 11 o'clock, the clock was supposed to fire a bullet. Only the cuckoo came out at 10.30. And who could rig up a clock like that? Old man John Stone, the dead man's father. Don't be ridiculous, Faraday. The reason I'm here is that John Stone is a nice old man. He fixed Mary's watch. I suppose that clears him, huh? And I suppose you're going to tell me a father never kills a son, huh? Sure, sure. There have been plenty of cases like that. But this one isn't. If old man Stone wanted to kill his son, he wouldn't go to all this trouble to do it. And besides, how could he know his son would be standing in front of that clock at that particular time? I don't know. You can say that about almost anything and be accurate, Faraday. Ah, ha. Joke over. I suppose you know who killed Walter Stone. No. You know, Faraday, I've heard of a man killing time, but this is the first case on record where time has killed a man. <laughs> What are you staring at, Madeline? This grandfather clock, Richard. It's hard to believe. You're a little bit sorry the bullet from this clock killed young Walter Stone instead of me, aren't you? A little bit sorry. Huh. My death would be quite advantageous to you, wouldn't it? You're putting it rather mildly. Mm, you amuse me, my dear wife. Your death would be equally advantageous to me. Really? Should I apologize? I'm sorry, but I don't intend to die. You don't? Walter Stone didn't intend to either. Arrangements might be made in your case, too. You're not very funny. Oh, no. I don't imagine I am, do you? I'm not very funny, but I am very alive. And also very much in my way. Imagine. You know, I was just thinking the same thing about you. Association of ideas, isn't it? I wonder what either of us is going to do about it. I can't make your plans, darling. All I can make is... Now, what's the matter with a clock? What's usually the matter with a clock when it stops running? It needs winding. In that case, I'll wind it. Don't bother. Oh, but it's no bother. I rather like the sound of it. With each tick, I feel I'm coming closer to getting rid of you. The same goes for me with every tuck. You know, there's something about you that... Uh... Richard, what's the matter? Uh... Richard. Richard, stop fooling. Richard, get up. Stop that very obvious play acting. All right, lie there if you like. Well, who are you? My name is Boston Blackie. Oh, what's wrong here? Uh... Something happened to my husband, he'd like me to think. You're Mrs. Van Horn? Yes. You might see what's wrong with him, if anything. I certainly will. Yeah. Well, nothing's wrong with him. Mm. Nothing that can be cured, that is. Sorry, but he's dead. Dead? I'm afraid so. What was he doing just before he fell? Why, nothing. Nothing at all. He was just winding that clock. Winding this... Aha. Uh -huh. Nice going, Mrs. Van Horn. Now, suppose you tell me all about it. Tell you all about it? I, I've told you all I know. He was just winding that clock and suddenly he fell. Uh-huh, but I don't fall for that story. Where's your phone? Right here on this table. Thanks. Who are you calling? I'm doing something very unusual in a situation like this. I'm calling the police. No. No, please, not the police. They'll say I killed my husband and I didn't. I... Faraday speaking. Hello, Faraday. This is Blackie. Well, Blackie, I suppose you know by now who killed Walter Stone, huh? No, Faraday, right now I don't even know who killed Richard Van Horn. Van Horn is dead? Yes, killed by the same clock that killed Walter. But that's impossible. We took the gun out of the clock after Walter was killed. I know, but Van Horn wasn't shot, Faraday. He was winding the clock when he got it. Which means he was tagged by that old poison needle gimmick. Poison needle, huh? A fine help you are. You go up to Van Horn's to find out who killed one guy, and the best you can do is tell me somebody else has been murdered. The best I can do, Faraday, is to find out who saw to it that his two victims got the worst of it. Here's old man Stone's cell, Blackie. Thanks, Rons. You got company, Mr. Stone? Oh? Well, 
I have? Yes, Mr. Stone. My name's Boston Blackie. Oh, yes. I've heard a lot about you. And, Miss Wesley, it's good of you to come to see me. Well, I asked to come, Mr. Stone, because I think maybe we can help you. Yeah, Blackie, let you and Miss Wesley in the cell with him. Don't think there's any danger from him. Thanks. Are you feeling any better, Mr. Stone? No, Miss Wesley, I, I'm afraid not. Okay, Blackie, you too, Miss Wesley. Go on in. Thank, Thank you, Lawrence. Ten minutes all you can have, Blackie. I may not need that. Sit down, Mr. Stone. No, I'd, I'd rather stand. Blackie, have you found out who killed my son? No, I haven't. But he will. You must find his killer, Blackie. I'm going to do my best. But let me ask you something. Do you know anything about a poison needle in the winding apparatus of the clock that killed your son? Poison needle? No. Well, it just killed a man, Richard Van Horn. And the police are going to think you're responsible for his death, too. No, Blackie, I swear, I swear I had nothing to do with any of this. Blackie, you'll have to be... You'll... Uh, Mr. Stone, uh, oh, uh, catch him, Blackie, he's falling. Yes. Here, I've got him. Here we are. I'll put him on the cot. Oh, Blackie, is he dead? Uh, wait till I get him on the cot. Whew. Yeah, there. Blackie, is he dead? No, Mary, he's not dead. Oh, good. He's out, but he just fainted. Well, I've got to get to work and start winding up the case where a man just died by winding a clock. July 23rd, 1946, Dick Colmer is Boston Blackie on Classic Radio Theater. Nothing is more important than protecting your family and property. That's why you should make a free call right now to Vivint, the number one smart home services provider in the U.S. Vivint will make your home safer and more secure with a state-of-the-art system that's so simple to use. Vivint smart home specialists provide award-winning monitoring of your system 24-7, 365 to respond to any emergency, even when you can't. And with the 4.5-star rated Vivint smart home mobile app, control your entire house from anywhere. Locks, cameras, security system, all at your fingertips on your mobile device. Call Vivint now and get a free quote, professional installation, and full smart home service for as little as $2 per day. Equipment purchase or service agreement required. Conditions apply. Call now. A smart home is a safer home. So protect your family and your property, home or business, with a Vivint smart home system. Call 800-619-7902. That's 800-619-7902. Call now, 800-619-7902. I used to wonder when I saw people going into nice hotels, really nice hotels, taking a pillow with them. That was before I got a my pillow because I know it doesn't matter where I'm going, whether I'm going to a one star, three star, five star hotel, my pillow goes with me, whether it's just overnight or whether it's on vacation. And here's the great deal about my pillow right now the lowest price ever offered on radio or TV two my pillow premium pillows for sixty nine. Nine ninety eight. That's only thirty four ninety nine per pillow. The lowest price ever offered on radio or TV, and it's still the same pillow. Great pillow, sixty day money back guarantee, ten year warranty, and call them one eight hundred nine five one eight one seven five or. Go to MyPillow.com, use promo code USA, click on the two-pack special, and get the best deal you've ever gotten on a good night's sleep when you get a MyPillow. Welcome to Tax Talk with Hollywood legend Bob Eubanks. You know, as part of Hollywood for a long time, I've seen my fair share of celebrities get in trouble with the IRS. Well, there's one name I trust, the Tax Defense Group. They're the most trusted name in tax. So if you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS, you really need to call my friends at the Tax Defense Group. Ignoring the IRS is not the solution. They can garnish your paycheck, levy your bank accounts, seize your home or business. But the Tax Defense Group could put a stop to all of that and tailor a program that would reduce your tax debt to pennies on the dollar. You gotta love that. So don't just take my word for it. Call them. Find out for yourself. They offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee and they're open 24 hours a day because they know that tax debt doesn't sleep either call now for your free and confidential tax analysis from the most trusted name in tax call 800-832-1594 800-832-1594 thanks for tuning in to classic radio theater on your favorite station more of dick calmer's boston blackie the murdering cuckoo clock from july 23rd 1946 Now back to Boston Blackie. (laughs) 
A beautiful grandfather clock has killed two people. Walter Stone, who is suspected of putting a gun inside the timepiece, and wealthy Richard Van Horn, who was killed by a poison needle hidden in the winding key of the clock. Faraday has arrested John Stone, Walter's father, as the killer. But Blackie feels John Stone is instant. He has no suspect to replace him, however, though he has a slight suspicion Van Horn's wife, Madeline, was anxious to get rid of her husband. As we return to our story, Madeline Van Horn is talking to Kenneth Wells, who seems to be more than just a friend. Kenneth, darling, you're so sweet to me. <laughs> you're easy to be sweet to, Madeline. Am I? I'm glad. I was so afraid you'd go away after this awful thing happened to Richard. Go away? I should say not, darling. After what happened to poor Richard, I have all the more reason to stay around. Oh, you're terribly kind. I don't know what I'd do without you. I know what you can do with me, darling. Hmm? Marry me. Marry you? Sure, why not? It's what we talked about doing as soon as... As soon as... Well, now that Richard has left you, what's there to stop us? Kenneth, are you trying to say that you arranged my husband's death? Well, let me put it this way. It wasn't a bad job, was it? Why, you... Get out of here! Darling! I said get out of here and I meant get out! Madeline, darling, after all Get we... out of my house this instant or I'll call the police. Maybe tell them about those little blackmail affairs of yours. All right, all right, but I don't know what's the matter with you. You don't, huh? Well, you'll find out if you don't stay away from me. Oh. <laughs> Hello? I'd like to speak to Boston Blackie, please. Oh, well, I'm sorry. He's not here. This is Mary Wesley, though. May I do something for you? Yes, this is Madeline Van Horn. Where can I get in touch with Blackie? Well, just a minute, and I'll get you the number, Mr. Van Horn. Uh, I've got it right here on a pad somewhere. Just a second. Oh, yes, yes. Here it is. Blackie is at the office of an attorney named Alexander. Your husband's attorney, I believe. <laughs> You think Mrs. Van Horn murdered her husband, Blackie? No, I don't say that, Mr. Alexander. She had the opportunity, yes, but I'm looking for a motive before I go any further. You're Van Horn's lawyer, and I thought that... that money might be the motive for Van Horn's murder, is that it? If it's enough money, it's enough reason for murder. Well, Blackie, according to the terms of Van Horn's will, Mrs. Van Horn does inherit a good part of his fortune, but I don't... Excuse me. Sure. Hello? Mr. Alexander, this is Madeline Van Horn. Is Boston Blackie there? Yes, just a minute. Blackie, it's Mrs. Van Horn. She wants to speak to you. Really? I'll take it. Thank you. Hello, Boston Blackie. Yes? Blackie, I think I know who killed my husband. I think I do, too, but uh, let's have your thought. I think Kenneth Wells murdered him. Kenneth Wells? Who's he? He's a man who's wanted to marry me for years. He even tried to get me to divorce Richard. I see. Well, what makes you think he killed your husband? He as much as said so. Well, this is very interesting. Kenneth Wells, eh? I'll go see Kenneth. And I've got an idea that all's well that ends well. <laughs> Mr. Stone, I was on my way to see a man named Kenneth Wells, but I thought I'd drop by the jail and see how you feel now. Is that name Wells familiar to you? I feel better, but I, I, I don't know that name, Blackie. Mm. I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm sorry I haven't been able to find out who killed your son or Richard Van Horn either. Oh, Blackie, this is awful. And I suppose the police still think I murdered my son and Van Horn too. Probably. Look, Mr. Stone, your son worked for you, didn't he? Oh, yes, he did. Well, look, I have a theory. Did he know anything about clocks? Yes, a great deal. In fact... Just a few hours before the accident, my son asked me if a clock could be fixed to fire a gun or, or poison someone. Oh, he did, did he? Well, what does that mean? Hey, wait a minute. The gun that killed your son was fired when the clock said 10.30. It was a cuckoo clock, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Well, I had a cuckoo clock once, but it struck only on the hour. Is there such thing as a clock where the cuckoo comes out on the half hour, too? Yes, but they're rare. So rare your son maybe didn't know that the murder clock was one of them? It's very possible he didn't know. Possible? I think the fact that he was killed is proof he didn't know. Stone, I've got this whole thing figured out. Just after 10 o'clock, your son set the clock to fire the gun when the cuckoo came out at 11. 
At 10.30, he was standing in front of the clock and got the blast he meant for somebody else. You mean my son intended to kill someone else? No, I think your son was hired to rig that clock so it would kill somebody. I think the somebody who hired your son was Kenneth Wells. But, but you told me that Mr. Van Horn was killed, too, and by the clock. How could... How you... could that have happened? I'll tell you how. Your son was playing safe. Just in case the gun didn't work, he put the poison needle in the winding key. I see. And after the gun was fired and my son was dead, Mr. Van Horn wound the clock knowing nothing of the poison needle. Yes, your son's death was accidental and so was Van Horn's. Stone, you're a free man. I am? Well, as good as free. All I have to do is find the man who hired your son to fix that clock. Then I'll fix his wagon. A fine date this has turned out to be, Blackie. Sorry, I kept you sitting here, Mary. And I'm going to leave you soon to see a man named Wells. Oh, great, great. You invite me to snoop around the Van Horn mansion for you. And what do I do? I sit here in this big room, having to smell this very heavy perfume. And then you come in just to say goodbye. Oh, well, keep me waiting and leave me shortly. That's Blackie. Whew, that perfume is heavy, isn't it? Sure. But listen, I had a talk with the butler, and it seems that Mrs. Van Horn isn't home. Well, I could have told you that. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Well, according to the butler, a man phoned her about two hours ago. He was obviously trying to disguise his voice. Just after she talked to him, Mrs. Van Horn left and wouldn't say where she was going. So? So, why would a caller try to disguise his voice? Because he was known here. And? And who was better known here than Mrs. Van Horn's boyfriend, Kenneth Wells? Uh-oh, I know what happens now. What? I go home like a good little girl while you go to see Kenneth Wells about being a bad little boy. Look, Wells, you're going to sit in that chair till it's an antique unless you start talking. You've got me all wrong, Blackie. I haven't done anything to talk about. You killed Richard Van Horn. Well, I certainly am surprised to hear that. Look, this is a nice little apartment you have here. But I'm going to break it up banging you around if you don't cut out that cute talk. What are you sniffing at? The cute talk? No. Something a little more pleasant. A familiar perfume. Look, Wells, you might as well start talking. I know you hired Walter Stone to rig a clock to kill Richard Van Horn. Why would I do that? To get rid of Van Horn so his wife could inherit his fortune and then you could marry her. You hired Walter Stone to rig that clock, didn't you? No, I've never even seen this Walter Stone. You saw him at the party when he was killed, didn't you? No, I was out of town the night of the party. In fact, I was out of town a whole week before the party. Just got back in town this morning. You were? Wait a minute. That gives me an idea. Van Horn could have been the one who hired Walter Stone. He's no, the... you're talking. And I think I'm making sense, too. Van Horn hired Stone to rig that clock to kill his wife. When Stone himself was killed, Van Horn thought the clock had done all the death dealing it was supposed to do. He didn't know Stone had put a poison needle in the clock, too. That's it. I'd bet on it. July 23rd, 1946, Boston Blackie on Classic Radio Theater. You know, for a while I worked in a hotel and I really used to go, why do people bring their own pillows with them? Well, once I got a my pillow, I understood. Because doesn't matter how good the hotel is, doesn't matter whether it's a two-star, three-star, five-star hotel, it doesn't matter how nice the hotel is if you don't get a good night's sleep. And the key to getting a good night's sleep is a my pillow. Now, the best deal ever offered on my pillow right now. You go to mypillow.com, enter our promo code USA, click the two pack special, and folks, you're going to get two My Pillow premium pillows for sixty nine ninety eight. That's thirty four ninety nine per pillow, the lowest price ever offered on radio or TV. Now it's the same My Pillow we've been talking about for months. It stays cool all night long. You don't wake up but to flip the pillow over in the middle of the night. It keeps its shape. You don't have to fluff it up in the middle of the night. 60-day money-back guarantee, 10-year warranty, and that's the deal. Try it for 60 days. You don't like it, send it back. 10-year warranty. Tell me another pillow you've got that's got a 10-year warranty. Nah. 
And the great thing is it's always as clean and fresh as new. If you get in a mess or after, you know, a couple of weeks, throw it in the washing machine, toss it in the dryer, fluff it up, and you got a brand new My Pillow. The lowest price ever offered on My Pillow, two My Pillow Premium Pillows, $69.98, $34.99 a pillow. You see if you can find a price like that anywhere else. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the two-pack special, enter my promo code USA, or call 1-800-951-8175. The best deal ever. And by the way, that promo code USA works on anything on the MyPillow website. MyPillow.com. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater on your favorite station. Boston Blackie was originally played in the movies and on radio by Chester Morris in a summer replacement series for Amos and Andy. When the series took off big time on radio, it moved from uh, uh, NBC to Mutual, where Dick Colmer took over the role of Boston Blackie. Now from July 23rd, 1946, the conclusion of Boston Blackie. Okay, now that you've got it all figured out, will you please get out of here? Oh, no. No, you're not completely in the clear yet. What did you want with Mrs. Van Horn when you talked to her today? I didn't talk to her. I know better. You called her up a little while ago, disguised your voice so the butler wouldn't recognize it, and Mrs. Van Horn was here in this apartment with you not long before I arrived. Why don't you get out of here, Blackie? You're wasting your time. And I agree with him, Blackie. Faraday, what are you doing here? Running around after you, Blackie. Oh, I suppose you found me with a divining rod. No, with a phone call to Alexander, Van Horn's lawyer. He said you're on your way up here. Now I'm here to tell you to get out. Look, Faraday, with the exception of the whereabouts of Mrs. Van Horn, your case is solved. Yeah? Who solved it? Who always solves your cases? Well, I did it again. Faraday, Stone and Van Horn were killed by accident. What? Yes, by accident. And it'll be an accident if you ever understand it. I'll explain it to you later. Right now, I think you and I better go to work on Wells here and find out what he's done with Mrs. Van Horn. I tell you, I haven't even seen her. You haven't. She's been here. I know that perfume of hers anywhere. Blackie, why don't you leave this guy alone? Look, if those deaths were accidental, as you say, he's as innocent as I am. Sure, of killing Stone and Van Horn. But I have an idea. Uh, Good. You're leaving? Swell. So am I. Hey, hey, Blackie. Look, that's not the door to the hall. I know it. It's a closet door. I'm going to start looking for Mrs. Van Horn, or at least find proof she was here. Oh, Blackie, don't be a sap. Blackie, stay away from that door. What's the matter, Wells? You a little nervous? Blackie, look out! Uh Uh-oh. Well, look what fell out of the closet. It's a woman. Dead. Who is she? She's corpse number three in our case, Faraday. But she was Mrs. Richard Van Horn. Mrs. Rich... Don't move, Wells. I've got a gun on you. You've well, also got the goods you. on him, Faraday. So Wells here was as innocent as you are, huh? Okay, okay. So I made a mistake. But you just found that body by accident. You didn't know Mrs. Van Horn was here. No, didn't I? I knew Wells was lying the minute he denied she'd been here. How? How? One whiff of a perfume and I smelled a rat. <laughs> I've got it. Got what, Faraday? Measles? No, you're not that lucky. I've got a confession from Kenneth Wells. You don't say. Yeah, you can look it over. Well, read it, will you? Not the first part. That's just routine. Okay, here's the place to begin. It says, I killed Mrs. Van Horn because she knew I was in town the night of her husband's death and that I had motive for killing him. Even though I didn't kill him, I knew I'd be a suspect. Mrs. Van Horn threatened to go to the police and tell them I was in town, and I couldn't let her do that. Hmm. You can read, can't you? In small words. Hmm. Ah, Wells was a cute kid, wasn't he? Says here he was afraid of Mrs. Van Horn for another reason, too. She threatened to go to the police and expose him as a blackmailer. Well, when I get them to confess, they really confess, huh? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. But you ought to be awfully ashamed of yourself, Faraday. Hmm? You stood in Wells' apartment and said he was perfectly innocent when Mrs. Van Horn's body was only ten feet away from you. Well, I can't see through a closet door, can I? No, I guess not. It says here in this confession, I quote, I killed her in my apartment but didn't get a chance to get rid of her body 
before Boston Blackie came in. Oh, all right. So you got there before me. But I would have pinned this on Kenneth Wells sooner or later. Uh, later, of course. Faraday, I doubt whether you ever would have figured out that Richard Van Horn hired Walter Stone to rig a clock that would kill Mrs. Van Horn? No. No, and even if you did, you'd never guess that both Van Horn and Stone were killed when their plan accidentally backfired. Actually, though, you should have solved this case by yourself. Yeah? Why? Well, the first shooting was done by a cuckoo clock, and you're a little cuckoo. Yeah? And the second killing was done by a poison needle, and you're poison to me and have been needling me for years. Yeah, Go ahead. And Kenneth Wells did keep Mrs. Van Horn's body in a dark closet. And Faraday, old pal, you've been in the dark all your life. And July 23rd, 1946, Dick Colmer as Boston Blackie. When Classic Radio Theater continues in three minutes, we'll start a new Yours Truly Johnny Dollar story. Nothing is more important than protecting your family and property. That's why you should make a free call right now to Vivint, the number one smart home services provider in the U.S. Vivint will make your home safer and more secure with a state-of-the-art system that's so simple to use. Vivint smart home specialists provide award-winning monitoring of your system 24-7, 365 to respond to any emergency, even when you can't. And with the 4.5-star rated Vivint smart home mobile app, control your entire house from anywhere. Locks, cameras, security system, all at your fingertips on your mobile device. Call Vivint now and get a free quote, professional installation, and full smart home service for as little as $2 per day. Equipment purchase or service agreement required. Conditions apply. Call now. A smart home is a safer home. So protect your family and your property, home or business, with a Vivint smart home system. Call 800-619-7902. That's 800-619-7902. Call now. 800-619-7902. If you enjoy our Classic Radio Theater broadcasts and want to start building a collection of your own, go to ClassicRadio.stream. That's ClassicRadio.stream. There you'll find links to great Classic Radio collections on CD, along with links to great reading on Classic Radio, plus Classic Radio Theater On Demand. Check out our webpage, available now at ClassicRadio.stream. That's ClassicRadio.stream. And enjoy. Hi, this is Kyle Horvath with the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board. If you want to get away from the big cities and get back to nature this summer, give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. There's so much to do and see, I can't mention it in 30 seconds, but check out our website and you'll see what Nevada is really all about. elynevada.net or follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Give us a call at 775-289-3720 or visit us online at elynevada.net. Tired of overpaying for the little blue pill? What if you could get the exact same results for just a fraction of the price, guaranteed? Well, now you can with sildenafil, the active ingredient in the blue pill. With 20 milligram generic sildenafil tablets, you get the exact same results for less than $2 per pill. And again, the results are guaranteed. That's right. Absolutely guaranteed results for a fraction of the cost of the little blue pill. So give your wallet a break and call us toll-free at 800-365-6017 to get your generic sildenafil delivered discreetly to your door. And of course, while saving hundreds of dollars, you'll also be saving time by saying goodbye to those long, embarrassing pharmacy lines once and for all. Again, just call 800-365-6017 and get your generic sildenafil with a 100% money-back guarantee. Getting your pills doesn't get any easier or cheaper than this, so call 800-365-6017 now. Let's wrap up this hour of Classic Radio Theater with part one of a five-part year's truly Johnny Dollar story, The Open Town Matter. It's a rather dangerous case Johnny Dollar's getting himself into. This was originally broadcast July 23rd, 1956. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ralph Kearns, Johnny. Great Plains Guarantee. Oh, hi, Ralph. Johnny, you're 52 years old. I am? Eight months ago, you married a lovely 27-year-old girl. Now I'm with you. A month later, you took out a $50,000 life insurance policy on a chief of police's salary. I did, huh? And who did I name as beneficiary? Your beautiful wife. Who else? So? 
So, three days ago, you were shot to death. Eh, I had a feeling it wasn't going to last. And 24 hours later, your wife files a claim on the policy. My friends tried to warn me she was fast. Well, there's the setup. What do you think? The same thing you probably do. In that case, you got just 56 minutes to catch the plane. The town is Greensport, Missouri. And watch yourself. What do you mean? From what I hear, Johnny, it's a wide open town. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Great Plains Guarantee Company, Hartford, Connecticut... The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the open town matter. (laughs) Item one, $84.60, transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Greensport and taxi to the townhouse hotel. I was hoping for a chance to shower and change, look around long enough to get my bearings and then edge into the case gradually. But it didn't work out that way. The case was already there and waiting for me right in the lobby of the hotel. All dressed up in a shiny black suit, squeaky black shoes, and a neater-than-neat little black bow tie. Oh, am I glad to see you, Mr. Dollar. Are you? Oh, indeed, yes, I am. I just breathed a great big sigh. Relief, you know, when I heard you tell the clerk your name. That's how I know you're you, you know. You mean there's been some doubt? But of course you'll want to know I'm me, so I'll swear I had a card in one of these pockets. Well, uh, maybe you could just tell me who you are, Mr. Uh... Potzer, Averill P. Potzer. I ought to have a card, though, to make it more official. Oh, never mind. I believe you. I must have given them all away. Don't worry, though. I'll get some more printed and see that you have one before you leave. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Potts. And now I just... Wait, Mr. Dollar. You want to talk to me, of course. Will I? Yes. I'm the agent here for the Great Plains Guarantee Company. I'm the one that sold that policy to the fellow that's dead. Oh, so that's it. Of course. (laughs) He wasn't dead then, you understand. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Feeling pretty lively, as a matter of fact, but with a new young wife and all that. I imagine so. But now Uh, just... Mr. Dollar... You've got to do something about that woman. Oh? Oh, she's driving me crazy. She wants her money, she says. $50,000. And she seems to think I'm carrying it around in my pocket. She's, uh, kind of anxious, huh? I'll tell you how anxious. Chief Blake was shot about two in the morning. And at three that afternoon, Marty, that's Mrs. Blake, was down at my office after a claim form. Yeah, I understand it was sent airmail special delivery. Well, she insisted on it. Made me take it straight to the post office as soon as she'd signed it. Pretty cold-blooded about it, huh? <laughs> Well, I've heard Marty Blake called a lot of different things in this town at different times, but never (laughs) cold-blooded. You follow me? I, uh, think I'm ahead of you. You know what I mean, all right, when you meet her. I can hardly wait. Man, oh, man, wow. Item two, a dollar and 15 cents taxi to the suburban home of Edgar Blake, former chief of police of Greensport, now deceased. On the strength of Potzer's description of the widow, I added a shave to the shower and change, and I hoped I looked a little fresher than I felt. The house was a rambling two-story job set back from the street. Well-kept shrubbery, nice lawn, quiet neighborhood, and plenty expensive. I wondered how Blake had been able to afford it. I was halfway up the walk when a man came out the front door. He wavered down the steps, then stopped and waited for me, rocking slightly on his heels. A copper. I can tell him a block away. You're a copper, right? Wrong. Private eye, maybe? No. Insurance investigator. Insurance. That's what I just asked her about. And you know what she did? Threw you out, probably. Right. Said I was drunk. Oh, ridiculous. That's exactly what I said. Ridiculous, I told her. Ridiculous. But you know something? She was right, I am. No. I can hardly believe it. It's a fact, though. At least a little bit. My name's Crayley. Joe Crayley. I'm a reporter. Greensport Daily Herald. Johnny Dollar. Hiya, Joe. Insurance, huh? And he did have some, or you wouldn't have had any reason to be here. She was lying. No comment. Who's a beneficiary? <laughs> Still no comment. It's her, of course. Little smarty Marty. His ever loved little wife. How much is she going to make on the deal? Uh, sorry, Joe. I... No comments. All right, let her lay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, tell me something, Joe. Uh... Suppose I want a little action, want to get into a poker game while I'm here, find a crap table, maybe. Any idea where I could go? Sure. Any one of half a dozen different... <laughs> How long have you been in town, Johnny? Mm, about an hour. You wised up pretty fast, didn't you? 
I didn't know it was a secret. The town is wide open, isn't it? It is. But I wouldn't go around poking into things if I were you. A guy could get hurt, you see what I mean? Maybe a guy did get hurt. Blake, you mean? What makes you think so? Well, if somebody wanted to keep the rackets going, the police chief would be a natural target, wouldn't he? Not necessarily. Meaning? No comment. What was Blake's salary, Joe? Six thousand a year. On six thousand, he was living in a house like this? Wait till you see Marty. She's even more expensive. So that's why Greensport is wide open. The police chief was in. No comment. Mm. Well, he's out now, that's for sure. Uh, Joe, I'll probably be talking to you later, so... Yeah, yeah, do that. Just ask anybody. Joe Crayley, the alcoholic that works for the Herald. I'm always around somewhere. Well, how do you do? Mrs. Blake? Yes, what can I do? Johnny Dollar. I'm representing the insurance company. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Come this way. I'm a little surprised, really. I hardly expected them to pay off so promptly. Well, in that case, you won't be too disappointed. Disappointed? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't come here to pay you anything. Then why did you come? I'm a special investigator, Mrs. Blake. What does that mean? The company would like a little more information about your husband's death. I told them all about it in the claim I sent to them. I know, but sometimes it's necessary. Oh, so that's the pitch. They're trying to squirm out of it. Why do you say that? Because they sent you here, that's why. And because they always do. I know how those companies operate. Oh, you've had experience with them before. No, I haven't. But I'm a real smart girl, Mr. Dollar. And I know a fast shuffle when I see it coming. And a smart girl ought to know better than to yell before she's hurt. Why else would they send out a special investigator? I told you why. They want some more information. What information? What is it they want to know? The details, that's all. Exactly how your husband was killed. I told them all that in the claim. I know. He was shot to death with his own gun right here in his own house. (sighs) Do you mind showing me how it happened? Oh, for the love. Now, look, there won't be any payment until I file my report, Mrs. Blake. All right. You win. When you go after something, you really go after it, don't you? Well, that's what I get paid for. Oh. And what about something you personally wanted? Well, that would depend on how bad I wanted it. I see. Would you like a drink? No, 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 thanks. You won't mind if I have one. Right ahead. Looking at you. Right. Now, uh, if you wouldn't mind... Yeah, I know. Stick to business. All right, come on. Happened over here, by the stairway. Mm -hmm. I see. Right here. This is where he fell. This is where he died. His gun was lying on the floor beside him. Middle of the night, wasn't it? About two in the morning, we'd been asleep. Why did he come downstairs? I heard a noise of some kind. It woke me up. I shook Ed and told him about it, and he came down to see what it was. He was armed? No. His gun was there on the hall table by the front door. Is that where he usually left it? Yes. Whenever he came home, he always took it off and put it there on the table. Then anyone who knew him would probably know they could find it there. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So uh, what happened? Like I said, it went on downstairs and I walked out of the bedroom into the hall. Were there any lights on? Not down here. I turned on the hall light upstairs. Did you hear your husband say anything? No, all I heard was the shots, four or five of them. Then I heard someone run out the front door. And what did you do? I called out to Ed, but he didn't answer. Then I ran downstairs and found him lying here, dead. Did you get a look at the prowler or whoever it was? No, it was too dark. And he ran out as soon as he fired the shots. How did he get into the house? The detective said he forced the lock on the front door. I guess that was the sound that woke me up. And then he used a gun that was inside the house that he may or may not have known was inside the house. That's what the police figure. All right. What do you figure, Mrs. Blake? The same thing, I guess. I don't know any more about it than they do. I thought you might have some theory of your own. I'll string along with them. Uh Uh-huh. Just an accidental prowler who got panicky and snatched up a gun that happened to be lying around handy. I guess that's about it. Any idea at all who the prowler might have been? Of course not. Do you suppose it could have been somebody besides a prowler? Somebody who came here for the express purpose of murdering your husband? 
Ed had a lot of enemies, of course, because of his job. What about his friends, Mrs. Blake? What do you mean? Do you suppose one of his friends could have done it? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been admiring your watch. Hmm, real nice. Set in diamonds, emerald band. Must be worth around $2,000. Very nice. Well, thank you. And this but... house, the furniture, that car out there in the driveway. On a police chief's salary, Mrs. Blake. I... I wouldn't know anything about Ed's financial affairs. Who runs the rackets here in Greensport? What rackets, Mr. Dollar? Was your husband in on them? Sure you won't have that drink? All right, Mrs. Blake, play it your way. I thought the insurance company was probably convinced that I was the one who killed him. They're not convinced of anything yet. But they think I did it, don't they? No, but they think 24 hours is pretty fast for a grief-stricken widow to shoot a claim into the office. I am not grief-stricken, Mr. Dollar. So I've noticed. Do I have to be? Is there some clause in the policy? No, you don't have to be. <laughs> you think I did it, don't you? I think there's a strong chance you did. Then I think you need a little straightening out. I'm listening. Uh-uh. Why should I make it easy for you? Go see Dave Sherman. Talk to him. Dave Sherman? The city attorney. See what he says before you get all lathered up. See if he thinks I'm guilty. All right, I will. And then we'll talk. And if you're nice enough to me, maybe I'll even cooperate. You never know. Do you? <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Before I do that, please let me say thanks to all of you who are so kind about writing and telling us how much you like Johnny Dollar. It's very gratifying, gratifying encouragement to all of us who are involved in production of the program. And we appreciate your letters more than you know. As always, I'll try to answer you promptly, but sometimes the mail does pile up. In any event, thanks. Thanks very much for writing. Tomorrow, a smash in the teeth opens things up and an airtight alibi gets air-conditioned with bullets. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Les Crutchfield, and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Like I said, this is going to be a really dangerous episode, the open town matter. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, this episode, July 23rd, 1956. Please, thank you. so. I, I want to thank you so much for, for listening to our show and driving our podcast so much. Remember, if you miss a day, you can always catch our podcasts at ClassicRadio.stream or anywhere fine podcasts are served. iTunes, Spreaker, the iHeartRadio app. Just search for USA classic radio theater thank you so much for tuning in i'm wyatt cox please thank this radio station support the advertisers and tell a friend the great radio shows are back classic radio theater here on your favorite station and the usa radio network